A number of people have testified in this inquiry referencing your widely published comments and calling the unvaccinated racists and misogynists. And we have heard testimony in this inquiry about how some of your officials wanted to label protesters as terrorists. Would you agree with me that one of the most important roles of a prime minister is to unite Canadians and not divide them by engaging in name calling? And you know what? If you don't want to get vaccinated, that's your choice. But don't think you can get on a plane or a train besides vaccinated people and put them at risk. Uh, I did not call people who were unvaccinated names. Vous hésitez un petit peu, on va continuer d'essayer de les convaincre, mais il y a aussi des gens qui sont farouchement opposés à la vaccination. Ils sont extrémistes. Qui croient pas dans la science, qui sont souvent misogynes, qui souvent racistes aussi. C'est un, 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 une petite, un petit groupe, mais qui prend de la place. Et là, il faut faire un choix en tant que leader, en tant que pays. Est-ce qu'on... Est-ce qu'on tolère ces gens-là ou est-ce qu'on dit, ben voyons, la plupart des gens, presque 80% des Québécois, ont fait ce qu'il fallait faire, se sont fait vacciner, on veut revenir à, 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 aux choses qu'on aime faire, eh, c'est pas ces gens-là qui vont nous bloquer maintenant. We have made the decision that federal public servants need to be fully vaccinated. Uh, that is something that we're also applying to everyone who gets on a plane or a train in the coming months in Canada. The small fringe minority. I highlighted there is a difference between people who are hesitant to get vaccinated for any range of reasons and people who deliberately spread misinformation that puts at risk the life and health of their fellow Canadians. Sure, Jan. And well, my focus every step of the way and the well, primary responsibility of a prime minister is to keep Canadians safe and alive. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects all Canadians, every one of us, even when it is uncomfortable. I'm the prime minister. I make up the rules as I see fit. I have never spoken badly or called Canadians names. Watch the Freedom Corp lawyer question Trudeau in this telling question period. Here's the clip. I want to first talk to you about the events that led up to the invocation of the Emergencies Act. You would agree with me that the Emergencies Act was invoked on Valentine's Day, Monday, February 14th, correct? Yes. And you are aware that this commission has received evidence from the police and other witnesses that on Monday, February 14th, the Ambassador Bridge was reopened, as was Coots. All the borders were reopened, correct? Uh Yes, and there was concern that more uh, locations were going to be uh, closed. Actually, Coots didn't open till Tuesday. Okay, well, we'll review the record for that. On the Sunday night, February 13th, there was an IRG meeting, and you were there, and in fact, you were the chair of that meeting, is that correct? Yes. And at the IRG meeting, you were advised that there, were breakthrough, there was a breakthrough agreement between the mayor of Ottawa and the convoy organizers to move trucks out of the downtown residential areas. Isn't that correct? Uh, that is not how I remember it, no. Okay, well, I can advise you that at the inquiry, it was confirmed by the documents your officials filed here and by witnesses, namely Jody Thomas. She confirmed that at that IRG meeting, you were briefed that there was an agreement with the mayor. Does that, uh, do you recall that? With whom? But and with the mayor and who? Some of the convoy organizers. Which ones? Well, Tamara Leach, who's present here in this room, signed a letter. It was made publicly available on the news on Sunday, February 13th, and you were advised of that agreement at the IRG meeting. And we were also advised uh, that that agreement wasn't holding and that many of the convoy had decried it as uh, fake news and not actually an agreement that they would abide by. And you learned that on Twitter, is that correct? No, we learned that at the at the IRG. By whom? By our uh, collected officials. Thanks. And now you should be aware that this commission has also received evidence from city officials and others that the next day, on Monday the 14th, over 100 protest vehicles had moved out of the downtown residential areas under the mayor's agreement, 
prior to your 4.30 p.m. announcement invoking the Emergencies Act. Is that right? Uh, I can't speak to that, but I'm sure others have or will. They have. And you are aware of the evidence before this commission from police officials and others who testified that the efforts by the truckers to further vacate the downtown residential areas under the mayor's deal were blocked by the police on both Tuesday and Wednesday, February 15th and 16th. Are you aware of that? Uh, no, I am not. My understanding was the police were allowing anyone who wanted to leave to leave. Okay. Would you agree with me that it would have been a far better outcome if you and your colleagues would have allowed the de-escalation agreement with the mayor to be completed and there would have been no need to invoke the extraordinary powers of the Emergencies Act, including the significant and violent police actions and freezing Canadians' bank accounts. If I could interrupt, uh, Commissioner, it's Brian Gover on behalf of the Government of Canada. The agreement was to move the protesters to Wellington. My friend is misstating the evidence in my submission. I could provide some clarity. Okay, go ahead. Um, it's very well known in the agreement with the mayor that it was to remove vehicles from the downtown residential areas, and yes, Mr. Gover, thank you, to move to Wellington, but out of residential areas apart from Wellington, so thank you. Can you now, are you able to answer the question? Uh, I believe the answer was no, but you can repeat the question if you like. Sure. If you had allowed the de-escalation agreement, in other words, moving trucks outside and other protest vehicles outside of the downtown area, there would be no need to invoke the emergency act. Mr. Commissioner, I... I object again because characterizing this as a de-escalation agreement uh, in my submission is a misnomer. This was a an agreement that didn't hold, but it was to move vehicles from residential areas to Wellington Street. Well, I'll let the question stand. I think it's a question of interpretation. Go ahead. So, no, I don't agree. Thank you. Your officials have testified that they, are that they were following the convoy as it began moving from regions of Canada towards Ottawa. And you are aware that thousands of Canadians lined the highways and overpasses to cheer the truckers. Is that right? Uh, I can't speak to the number, but yes. Thank there, you. Was, there were many supporters, yes. Mr. Prime Minister, I would like to read to you an excerpt from three of the many statements that Canadians prepared for this commission. Canadians who supported the convoy and explained why. And I would like, I would ask the registrar to bring up document ID HRF 401660. If you could turn to page 274, please. And while that comes up, I'll just start reading the statement. 200. 74. Elizabeth Klapik provided a statement about how the government's COVID mandates and lockdowns disrupt, disrupted her life. Starting at paragraph three, she said, the truckers and the Canadians who lined the roads, overpasses and highways restored the hope that I had almost lost. These patriotic Canadians told me that I am not alone, that I matter. I will never forget the hope and pride I felt watching these amazing truckers driving along Canadian highways, crowded with patriotic fl Canadian flying, patriotic Canadians flying their flags and holding their signs of support. I will never forget the tears I shed as I regained that almost lost hope, that love for my home and native land that love for my fellow Canadians. At page 235, Ottawa resident Karen Hanna, who obtained a sociology degree from Ottawa University, starting at paragraph five stated, for months, 
the leader of our country publicly shamed people like me and my husband. Our own family members turned on us, blamed us, and some even told us we don't deserve health care. Paragraph 17. One of my most emotional moments was dancing on Rideau Street beside a local man. He had tears streaming down his face. All he wanted was a hug. It was very over overpowering for him. I met a girl, 22 years old, who just hopped in her car from Winnipeg and just kept driving. She stayed the entire time. I met people who were like family to me. People who gave up everything to come to Ottawa for justice and an explanation. At page 116, here is one of many, many concerned parents and spouses. Sam Crozier at paragraph eight says, I am not asking for help. I am begging you to please listen, hear my heart, feel my pain, and help work towards the true North strong and free that we were promised. My husband, an army veteran who now has PTSD, and not from anything he has seen or done in the forces, but from what our own government has done. Our government has destroyed my life. I, a once optimistic, full of life person, find myself struggling to stay above water now. I struggle to find joy in anything and daily fear a new announcement being made that will further punish us. I have written the same email to every member of parliament daily and been ignored by a large collection of the people meant to be our leaders, meant to be listening to us. Mr. Prime Minister, you have now heard the statements from some of the many concerned Canadians who felt compelled to support the protesters. Do you now understand the reason so many Canadians came to Ottawa with such resolve in the midst of a harsh, cold Canadian winter because of the harms caused by your government COVID mandates, and they wanted to be heard. Uh, I am moved, uh, and I was moved, as I heard uh, these testimonies, as I saw the depth of um, hurt and anxiety about the present and the future expressed by so many people, that COVID pandemic was unbelievably difficult on all Canadians. And my job throughout this pandemic was to keep Canadians safe. And the way that I chose to do that was to lean on public health officials, lean on experts and science on the best way to keep Canadians safe. And because Canadians got vaccinated to over 80%, we had fewer deaths in Canada than places that didn't reach that. And every heartbreaking story I hear of a family who sat beside the bed of a loved one dying because they had believed that the vaccines were more dangerous than the disease, I take personally because I wish I could have done more and, and to I don't convince mean to, people to, cut to you get off, vaccinated. But I only have 10 minutes. So thank you. That was helpful. You, uh, Mr. You, Prime just, just to interrupt you, you're going to have to shorten it because you're, you're uh, already over your time. Okay. Thank you. A number of people have testified in this inquiry referencing your widely published comments and calling the unvaccinated racists and misogynists. And we have heard testimony in this inquiry about how some of your officials wanted to label protesters as terrorists. Would you agree with me that one of the most important roles of a prime minister is to unite Canadians and not divide them by engaging in name calling? Uh, I did not call people who were unvaccinated names. I highlighted there is a difference between people who are hesitant to get vaccinated for any range of reasons and people who deliberately spread misinformation that puts at risk the life and health of their fellow Canadians. Okay, and well, my focus every step of the way and the well, primary responsibility of a prime minister is to keep Canadians safe and alive. 
Right. So uh, in terms of safety, uh, you, when you met with, I'll, I'll reframe, Minister Blair, Public Safety Minister, Minister Mendicino, National Security Intelligence Advisor Jody Thomas, and RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky, and today you testified that the federal government was committed to exhausting all alternatives to a resolution prior to making a decision to invoke the extraordinary powers of the Emergencies Act. Do you agree that that accurately describes your government's position? That the invocation of the Emergencies Act was a measure of last resort, was not something to be taken lightly. Thank you. And something to do when, when uh, other options uh, were not effective. And you are aware that the OPP, along with others, developed an engagement proposal and you were advised of that proposal at the IRG meeting on February 12th, correct? Um, it was a proposal, but we had, and it was presented to us, we had more questions uh, about uh, how it would actually work. Uh, there, it was not a complete proposal. My last question, Mr. Prime Minister, when did you and your government start to become so afraid of your own citizens? That's a very I unfair... I am not, and we are not. Those are my questions. Thank you.